So just to introduce um, Daniel. Uh, Daniel is a senior research fellow at Dublin City University and an associate fellow of the Centre of European Reform in London. Before that, he worked at the Euro uh, European Movement in Dublin and the Centre for Security Studies at ETH Zurich, the Foundation for International Relations in Brussels and Madrid, the European Insti Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris, the Centre for European Reform in London, the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defence University in Washington, D.C., and the Aspen Institute in Berlin. So quite a, a, quite a, um, a list of uh, institutions. Daniel was a member of the World Economic Forum's Expert ne Network and has been a columnist for the Strategic Europe blog uh, of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace from 2015 to 2018, a member of the Executive Academic Board for the European Security and Defence College as the ESDC from 2007 and 2000 to 2011, and uh, a co-opted member of the Committee of the University Association for Contemporary European Studies from 2003 to 2006. He has testified on EU foreign security and defence policies before committees at the Irish uh, Roctus, the UK House of Commons and the European Parliament, and has also advised several European governments and carried out studies, both alone as part of a consor of consortia commissioned by the European Union and NATO. He is regularly invited to speak at conferences organized by governments, think tanks and international organizations and has been a guest lecturer at the University of Cambridge, King's College London, the Institut d'Etudes Politique de Paris and the New York University. He's written many uh, academic uh, articles for academic journals and um, uh, been a, a media work in, includes TV and radio interviews on Al Jazeera, BBC, Sky News, France 24, CNN and Fox News. Um, tonight's uh, webinar, uh, we're going to discuss EU defence policy, which was formally launched at the Cologne Summit in June 1999. Daniel um, has analysed that policy area since its inception, working at uh, the different research institutions mentioned above over 22 years. And this evening, he'll discuss some of the lessons he has learned about EU uh, defence policy during that time. So, Daniel, um, I'm very happy to uh, hand over to you now. Thanks very much. That was your introduction was nearly as long as the speech I was planning to give, but I'll try and say a little bit more. But that was very, very kind. Thank you. Um, and as you mentioned, I've recently moved to Dublin City University. So in a more academic direction until now, I've been working mainly as a policy analyst at various think tanks and NGOs in different places. And most of that time, I've been working on EU defence policy or CSDP, as it's usually called in the jargon. Um, so I just wanted to give an idea of some of the basic lessons I've learned from looking at it as an analyst. So not so much as an academic yet, um, since I'm new to the academic world, but more uh, to give an idea uh, of how it looked to me as an analyst over the last 22 years. <clears throat> and I thought the easiest way to kind of frame this would be to give a lesson from each place I worked in. Um, so that would be six lessons from six different places. Uh, but before I start off with the lessons, I should mention I came into this subject a little bit by accident as a master's student uh, in Washington, D.C. at, at SICE, the Johns Hopkins uh, Master's School. Um, and it happened to be the period that both the San Malo summit happened, which was the Anglo-French summit, where they agreed that the EU should have an EU defence policy that was in December 1998. And I happened to be doing a course on European security and then the Kosovo war happened. So there was tremendous interest in Washington uh, and I became very interested in the subject uh, partly because of these events. And I luckily, my then professor whose day job was working at the National Defence University at the Institute for National Strategic Studies, she asked me to come and work for her in Washington. But the second remark I'd like to make in general, what makes CSDP or EU defence interesting or frustrating, depending on how you want to look at it, is in a way you have to know something a bit about both, a bit about the EU and a bit about the defence world. And frankly, traditionally, these are worlds that don't normally collide that often. They're quite different ecosystems uh, in the sense that most people who work in real defence you know, don't have to deal with the EU. Certainly, if you look at EU member states, for instance, NATO is much more important for their defence than the EU is. 
for example. And likewise, on the EU side, the EU has its own very particular history and has traditionally been much more focused on economics. And indeed, when I started working in Washington, uh, the main image that my colleagues at the National Defence University had, they assumed that the EU was primarily a trade organisation and they wanted to know why is it the EU wants to have a defence policy, a security and defence policy, and what does this mean for NATO? I, of course, rather naively then pointed out that you do realise you have experts at the State Department who know a lot about the EU, who've negotiated trade deals, who could tell you quite a bit about it. And they replied, Daniel, this is the Pentagon. We never talk to the State Department. So that was my first lesson in interagency competition. And it's quite an important lesson to understand the differences in mentality between defense ministries and foreign ministries and, and indeed between services and so on. Uh, but the first lesson I learned really <clears throat> in Washington at the National Defense University was there is a strategic case for an EU defense policy of some type uh, for Europeans to be able to act themselves if they have to. Now, as I, I may have mentioned, I started working there roughly the same week as the Cologne summit in June 1999, which formally launched the EU, the CSDP. It was actually called CESDP at the time, but let's not get too lost in the acronym soup. Uh, but the, the government's essentially building on the Franco-British agreement at Saint Malo, they agreed very ambitious language to be able to act to be able to act autonomously, and then they agreed at the Helsinki summit the same year in December 1999 that they would be able to deploy a so-called rapid reaction force with around 60,000 soldiers in principle, uh, which you know was pretty ambitious. Um, and part of the thinking behind this, it wasn't uh, Kosovo had some impact, of course. But it shouldn't be forgotten that San Malo was agreed before the Kosovo War happened. And the Bosnian War was a very traumatic experience for many Europeans. Uh, as we know, that war dragged on for a number of years before the United States got involved to try and help bring it to an end as quickly as possible. And at the beginning, Europeans, some European states were backing different sides in the various Yugoslav wars. So it was an awful experience. And we know how difficult the peacekeeping experience was as well uh, in Bosnia. So one of the reasons why the British and the French, I mean, the French had always wanted the Europeans to be able to act alone if necessary. That's been a French aim pretty much since the Suez crisis of 1956. You know, never have to rely on the Americans alone. You know, the French invest in, a, in an autonomous nuclear deterrent etc. The interesting reason is why Britain uh, wanted, uh, agreed with France that there should be a European plan B, as it were. And I think the Bosnian experience is a big part of it. I think also the Kosovo experience helped consolidate or sustain that viewpoint in the Blair administration, if I can put it like that, because of course Tony Blair came to power in 1997 because there were various fights between the Clinton administration and the Blair premiership over the Kosovo war and whether or not to deploy land forces and all that sort of thing. Uh, and also because Blair was very keen that the UK should lead in Europe. Now that sounds a uh, very romantic nostalgic history now at this stage post Brexit, but at that time Blair was very serious. However, he knew that it was not certain at that time that the UK would join the Euro depending on what the opinion of his chancellor would be. Uh, and obviously the UK wasn't going to join Schengen, but the UK could lead on foreign policy and especially defense policy because it's a leading military power. So the idea was to kind of counterbalance the Franco-German tandem, uh, which has traditionally driven the EU forward. And bearing in mind the Euro was about to come online and enlargement was due to happen within the next decade at that time. So this was a way of trying to make the UK into more of a leader at the EU table. So this is why I say with when it comes to CSDP, one always has to bear in mind broader EU politics. It's, it's not only about defence or military issues. Maybe the interesting question today is to ask, does the case for a European plan B still exist? Now, I would argue it certainly does, and indeed more so than it did even 
22 years ago uh, as it is now. Um, I mean, even if you, and, you know, leave aside what form that European Plan B could take, whether you consider it, it should be a European army or whether it should be a European military alliance, like the old Western European alliance, which of course is actually older than NATO originally. Uh, just look at the way the global security picture is changing. You know, around roughly 10 years ago, the Obama administration announced its so-called pivot to Asia, which I understand is understood not necessarily in the way we understand pivot, but in the basketball sense. Um, this is uh, this is how, uh, how it was explained to Obama. But anyway, the point being that East Asian security is becoming ever more important for American security and indeed global security, primarily because of the rise of China. I think that's fairly self-evident. <clears throat> At the same time, Europe's broad neighborhood has also become quite unstable. Whether one wants to discuss Russian actions to the east in Ukraine, or indeed uh, in places like Moldova, or in the Caucasus, or indeed Turkish behavior, or indeed the various wars and conflicts across the Middle East and North Africa down to the Sahel. Uh, Europe's broad neighborhood is almost like a kind of an ozone layer, a, a hole in the ozone of stability, if you like. Um, and it, you know, Europe is surrounded by a lot of instability. And the US may not always be interested in putting out these fires. Uh, a good example of that actually was also in, in the Obama administration. Initially, the Pentagon was not that keen to intervene in Libya. And it was very much a Sarkozy and Cameron push uh, to the Americans that got them involved, but those operations did not start out as NATO operations. They actually started out as separate national operations. And it was very much the French and the British pushing the Americans uh, to lead from behind, as the phrase was at the time. Uh, but what if in the future, the Americans didn't want to intervene in the next Libya? And there's quite an interesting debate in the United States about that. I mean, you, we, uh, during the Trump administration, it was noticeable how he wasn't so interested in what was happening in Lebanon, for example, or indeed Nagorno-Karabakh, or indeed did he want to get involved in disputes between Greece and Turkey. So, you know, the, the, there's plenty potentially that Europeans may have to deal with by themselves. And that feeds into the whole debate about strategic autonomy, which is pushed by France in particular, has also taken on a new meaning with the COVID crisis. You know, should Europeans produce their own masks, for example, and not depend on China or other uh, PPE uh, supplies, things like that. Um, so the, 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 there's a whole debate about strategic autonomy, which is part of this. But I think that the first lesson anyway is that there is a, st a strategic case for EU defense. <clears throat> the second lesson I learned was in London and uh, working at the Center for European Reform, a very different institution to working at the National Defense University for the Pentagon, in that it, it's a EU affairs focused think tank, an independent think tank. And so defense would be one subject amongst many EU subjects. Uh, rather than trying to fit the EU into the defense world, I had to fit defense into the EU world, if you see what I mean. And, and this was the period when Javier Solana was the high representative, and trying to get CSDP or ESDP actually, as it was called then, it already changed its name. Um, he was trying to get it up and running. So you had a new committee with the political security committee, setting up a new military staff, uh, and most of all, trying to get operations up and running. But it was also a period when uh, both the Clinton and Bush administrations were very nervous about the EU duplicating NATO in any way. And so Solana was quite keen uh, to try and show that the EU is different to NATO, partly too because with the splits over the Iraq war in 2003, the Atlanticists led by the UK, but the, there are many countries who would be very pro-NATO in the EU, were not keen for the EU to go in a direction that seemed to undermine NATO, while the more Europeanists uh, at that time, mainly France and Germany, uh, obviously, we're happy that the EU has something to build on. Frankly, I think that tension suited Ireland, by the way, because it prevented the EU from becoming a mini NATO uh, and indeed pushed the EU much more in a mini United Nations direction. What I mean by that is 
that CSTP, if you look at the operations, for instance, that, that the EU has carried out, the peace support operations, only about a third have been military peacekeeping operations uh, or uh, naval missions, of course. The, the vast majority have been civilian operations, things like security sector reform, building up, say, the Ukrainian judiciary, <coughs> excuse me, or the Kosovo judiciary, uh, or trying to help Libyan uh, border guards at one stage before the civil war kicked in and so on. Um, that takes up a lot more of CSTP's time uh, than military operations do. Uh, if you look at all the operations, they're obviously very long-term operations as well, because state building is a very long-term investment, but there is a logic to it. And the EU, frankly, is usually better at long-term than, than quick reaction. <coughs> But more importantly, what Solana kind of nailed down was that EU defense is not a defense policy in the sense that it does everything but defense, territorial defense. Uh, EU defense is really EU military cooperation. It's the military component of the EU's international security policy or foreign policy. Uh, and at that time, Solana was very keen to try, <coughs> excuse me, was very keen to try and bring together defense diplomacy and development. That the EU had a lot of different resources it could potentially tap, but they weren't brought together in the system. And this was part of the thinking uh, for the Lisbon Treaty as well, uh, that came through in 2009. So the current holder of that post, Borrell, is now both the vice president of the commission and a high, represent high representative in the council. In theory, to bring these different elements of foreign policy tools together. Uh, but it's very important to remember that EU defense policy is not a defense policy. And actually the EU does everything but territorial defense and it's really focused on external security, not internal security. There is a whole other world of internal security, uh, which is interesting too, but the, but the military aspect, the EU's role in the military aspects of that are quite limited uh, to say the least. Uh, but that brings me actually to the third lesson. So if we remember that CSDP is part of the broader foreign policy box or envelope, if people prefer, I mean, as you're aware, uh, actually formally it's the foreign minister's council that takes decisions on EU, on CSDP. Uh, the defense ministers meet in a sub uh, uh, version of the foreign ministers. It's not formally its own council separately. It's the same for development ministers as well, but it gives you, this is very different to NATO where defense ministers meet in their own separate format. <coughs> but the point is that CSDP is still almost entirely intergovernmental. Um, and what I mean by that is it means that the EU will, if there were an Oscars for international security, the EU will never be nominated or never, certainly never win best actor, but it might at least be nominated for best supporting actor. And that's the best way to try and think about the EU's role. It's always in support of member state efforts. But of course, when you have to get unanimity, as you do on most aspects of EU defense policy, excuse me, um, it makes it quite difficult. And even if you look at well, by this stage, I was working in Paris in the belly of the beast in a way because I was working at the EU Institute for Security Studies, which is part of the European External Action Service. So I got to meet the different committees and agencies, the European Defence Agency, military staff, um, <clears throat> uh, and, and so on, political security committee and so on. So I got to see different bits of it and even how the parliament interacts with it and 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 the various tensions between the council and the commission. We don't need to go into that. But even if you just look at the number of people working on CSDP, there's really only around 500 people in the EU system that do CSDP. <clears throat> Compare that with NATO down the road in Brussels at the NATO headquarters, it's closer to 5,000 people, just to give you an idea. So there hasn't been nearly the same investment in CSDP by EU member governments as there has been in NATO. Now, there's lots of reasons for that. The United States, for instance, is not a member of the EU, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just to point out um, that, that, that it's a very different organization to NATO in that respect. 
<coughs> and is more like a rich regional version of the United Nations, if anything. Um, and really the two main jobs that um, the EU tries to do, it tries to be an option for, for member states to carry out peacekeeping operations. Uh, so whether, for example, like the Irish-led mission in Chad, for instance, 2008, 2009, if I remember correctly, uh, and I had the pleasure of visiting, uh, visiting some, uh, I don't know if anyone here listening would remember, I came out to Mont Valeria to visit uh, our officers uh, who are working with the French. And one, one thing I do remember are complaints about the food. The French food wasn't very good, but maybe I'm giving away state secrets, so I better say no more. Uh, but that was really fascinating. And I know from the French side, because I used to work with them a lot, that they were very impressed and very happy with how things worked on Chad. But, <coughs> excuse me, but peacekeeping operations is one thing. And the second thing that the EU tries to do is help member states use their resources better. Now, resources mainly is about budgets, of course, but not only. It's also about sharing existing resources, capabilities, uh, or even potentially if, uh, to encourage pooling of uh, armed formations, although that tends to happen more outside the, the EU structure. So my own view, based on that experience of watching the system in Brussels, <coughs> I, am, I certainly don't think the EU is going to become a superpower any day soon, um, uh, and anyway, it would need to become a super state for that to happen. But it could at least try and be a super partner, and especially with its own member states, and also with the United Nations, with NATO, with the United States, with the African Union, you name it. Uh, but you get the basic idea. But it'll never be the lead actor in that sense. Mm. Forgive me, I have a frog in my throat, but I'll keep, I'll keep going. <clears throat> and then I moved on to Brussels, and the lesson I was working there for uh, an NGO, a think tank called the Foundation for International Relations, uh, which is also involved with the Club of Madrid, uh, where Mary Robinson is very involved uh, on human rights and democracy and so on. And there, while I was in Brussels, the big lesson I learned is it, it, defining the European interest is extremely difficult extremely difficult. Now, this was partly the period when the Ukrainian crisis happened. Now, there wasn't a military response to the Ukraine, well, not by the European, the European Union, at least, <laughs> to the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, as you may remember, Ukraine was negotiating uh, a free trade deal, uh, a, more, a deeper, more comprehensive one than what the UK recently signed with the EU, but a very important one. And clearly for many Ukrainians, that was a symbol of their desire to be closer to the EU and eventually join the EU. And then the then Ukrainian president was put under pressure by the Russian president Vladimir Putin and hesitated on signing the deal and the various Euromaidan protests as they were called started. And that eventually we had the Russian annexation of Crimea and there's still the ongoing war in Donbass. Uh, and you're all aware of that. But what struck me at the time, and this might sound familiar when we think about the recent Article 16 story with the protocol at the end of January, like most of the people dealing with the nego negotiations with Ukraine were technocrats rather than diplomats, and they were following a process. Uh, and the product was the trade deal. Uh, there wasn't much discussion of the broader geopolitics. It didn't seem to occur to many people how Russia might react. Now, that's not to say, you know, uh, that doesn't excuse what Russia, how Russia reacted. Uh, but there was a lot of criticism, and there still is with the EU, that sometimes it does things without understanding the politics. And it, it, I, I was reminded very much of you, the Ukrainian example when the Article 16 signal was wrongly sent on January 29th, that this was a classic technocratic move uh, without people not realizing or understanding the politics or geopolitics for that matter. Um, and so it wouldn't surprise me at all that that would happen. Um, but the, there was elements of that with Ukraine as well. But, but what one thing I did learn from the Ukrainian experience, it's much easier to define a European interest and agree on non-military actions. So 
you know, the Europeans, in particular Germany, actually uh, played a very strong leadership role and, and has since. Uh, I know this goes against the grain of some of the uh, stereotypes on this subject, but Angela Merkel was quite tough in trying to get the Europeans to agree on sanctions on Russia. And if you had said in 2014 that those sanctions would still be there on Russia, not many people would have expected that, but they are still there. Uh, and uh, yes, there is a very lively debate in Germany about Russia, uh, but they did manage to agree on it because there was a clear common interest, uh, because obviously annexation is not something the EU wants to condone. Um, when it comes to the military issues, this was also the fallout of the Libyan experience. Um, you know, <clears throat> while some people would say the NATO operation in Libya in itself was a very successful military operation. The fallout afterwards was has been disastrous. Um, and there are many reasons for that. I'm not expert enough on the civil war in Libya to explain why, but clearly, you know, some of the lessons from Iraq don't seem to have been learned. Uh, you know, we didn't seem to be very, we as Europeans in the broad sense, didn't seem to be very well prepared for the aftermath. Um, <clears throat> and even if you remember back, in 2008, I think it was, uh, the United Nations, because normally Solana, when he was high representative, he was responding to requests from the United Nations to send EU peacekeepers, because the UN can find kind of regular peacekeepers easily enough, but to find robust, quick intervention peacekeepers is harder. And Europeans have those resources. And he, uh, the UN Secretary General asked Solana if the EU could send some peacekeepers to Eastern Congo, which it had done in 2003 before. And so the UN thought, could you do that another time? Because there was a, if I recall correctly, there was a massacre in Kivu in Eastern Congo and uh, the UN wanted the EU to intervene to stop that massacre. Uh, but there was no agreement on sending a EU force because the ideal format would be an EU battle group, which are these small formations. You would know more about battle groups now than me. And at the time, it was a British, uh, British German battle group, um, but they did not want to go because Obama had just been elected and they wanted to send what military resources they could send anywhere. They wanted to send them to Afghanistan because ultimately the relationship with the United States was more important than the relationship with the United Nations or helping people in Eastern Congo. Uh, the, the kind of silly part about that, though, is the, the six months before that, the Nordic battle group, including Ireland, had been on standby. And indeed, the Swedes, the Finns, the Irish would have been very happy to go. So it can be very, very difficult to define the European interest and therefore certainly even harder to agree on when to use military force or when to use military resources. Uh, and maybe the best example of that is actually Brexit. You know, uh, why has the EU, one of the reasons the EU has been so tough on the protocol and on Brexit generally is protecting the single market. And the single market is the one bit of the European Union that every member state signs up to. Not every member state is in the Euro, they're not all in Schengen like ourselves. They don't, they're not all even in CSTP fully like Denmark, um, but every single member state is in uh, the single market. And so protecting that was a crystal clear interest for all the 27 member states. And that's why the EU could be so tough and has been so tough. But defining the European interest in many situations is very difficult. I mean, compare that with how different Europeans reacted to Greek-Turkish tensions. You know, the Greeks were hoping that they would get support the way Ray Turkey, the way Ireland got support Ray the UK, but they didn't, not to the same extent because the Germans had a different position to the French and so on. But on Brexit, at least, it was extremely clear what that European interest was. Now that brings me to the fifth lesson. Uh, and there's only one more after that. Uh, the fifth lesson was why I moved then to Zurich to work at a university at a think tank, actually paid for by the Swiss uh, Department of Defense, hint, hint to the Irish Department of Defense. Um, and they put lots of money into it and did fantastic studies on Swiss security, on global security. The Swiss are very strategic thinkers, given their location in the middle of, well, 
uh, in the middle of Western continent, uh, to be correct. And of course, surrounded by France, Germany, Italy in particular. I never forget the Austrians. You never know what the Austrians are up to. But they, they're very, uh, very astute observers and, uh, of what's going on around them. And of course, they take national defense very seriously. And these days that includes cyber and all those things as well. So it took me away, it took me out of the CSDP box, which was no harm, which is one of the reasons I wanted to go there, because they actually wanted me to work on more national defense policies. So I spent a lot of time working on British defense, French defense policy and German defense policy, and a little bit on Italy and Poland as well, but the, the big three in particular. And it's great in Switzerland because you have linguistic resources as well. So many French speakers, German speakers and Italian speakers uh, on top. Uh, but what you see when you look at the European defense world beyond the EU, goodness, the EU only accounts for a tiny, tiny bit. There is so much going on. And indeed, even just NATO wouldn't give you half the story. Um, you know, and even leaving aside what countries do on a national basis, just looking at military cooperation, I think the EUISS in Paris, where I used to work, they calculated a few years ago something like three or four hundred different military projects. I can't remember the precise figure, so I don't want to mislead too much, but definitely at least 300, if not closer to 400. Uh, different types of military projects. Now, they could be joining up formations like German Dutch tanks or Benelux naval forces. It could be uh, something like the European Air Transport Command in Eindhoven uh, or the C-17 base in Hungary. Or it could be developing the A400A military plane together or working on air defense together like the MIADs with the United States for Germany and Italy the medium extended air defense system, the whole rake, a whole variety of things. And what was striking when you looked at, of course, at that time, defense budgets had taken an enormous hit from the economic crisis. This would be around 2015, before Brexit, before uh, President uh, Trump was elected. And the governments were realizing at the same time, our strategic environment is becoming more difficult because we both have to be able to defend and intervene to some degree. We have to be able to defend against Russia to the east, and we have to be able to intervene sometimes to put out to cope with problems to the south, so in very simple terms. Uh, and that means when you have more limited budgets and more strain potentially strategically, it means that governments have to be both more flexible and more targeted. And so essentially the attitude is whatever works, whether if I can get something that works through bilateral cooperation, or, you know, Franco-British is a good example, Franco-German, or regional cooperation. I mentioned Benelux already, but Baltic or Nordic or Visegrad uh, or ad hoc, such as an equipment project or how the Eurocore in some ways has evolved from a Franco-German base now into something like five or six countries. And that's before you get near NATO, EU, UN operations, by the way, I would count on that too. Uh, you know, for example, what Irish peacekeepers are doing in Unifil and Undoff is also very important for European security, in my opinion. Um, but it means that most countries have to specialize. And you look at, say, the 27 members of the EU, or indeed the European members of NATO, if one prefers, uh, the 28 European members of NATO, or whatever it is now. Um, Italy and Poland, who are amongst the biggest you know, and who spend reasonable amounts of money on defense, they are already specializing. So you can imagine how much everyone else has to specialize. What I mean by that is Italy, if you look at the Italian white paper, I think it was published 2015, 2016 on defense. It's very much focused on external operations in the Euro Mediterranean area, naturally, because of what's happening with Libya, civil war, refugee flows, etc. And of course, the impact of Syria, Lebanon, the Italians, for instance, are, are with the Irish in Lebanon and Unifil as well. Um, but very, very focused on external operations. Poland, on the other hand, has gone the other direction, very, very focused on territorial defense, investing in new naval assets, investing in building up the army, including the reserve force, quite considerably. <coughs> Completely different type of 
operational focus to Italy. So if Poland and Italy have to specialize, you can imagine how much everyone else has to specialize. And you would know more about how our own defense forces specialize. You would know much more about that now than me. But uh, so it's really only three countries who can aspire to cover the full gamut of uh, uh, operational ambition, meaning being able to defend and being able to intervene, namely France, Britain, naturally, uh, and Germany. And Germany also aspires to it, even if it can't do it as well as France and Britain, it can do it more than anyone else. OK. Uh, the difficulty is, though, you know, France, Britain and Germany, between the three of them, account for oh, roughly 60 percent, maybe close to two thirds of NATO Europe defense spending, um, which is pretty substantial. So what they do has a big impact on the overall European capability, if you look at it collectively. But of course, it's very difficult to get them to agree. <laughs> And if they're not aligned politically, and they have very different strategic cultures, <clears throat> although there's, there's some overlap in that, you know, France and Germany are traditionally very pro-EU, but Germany and Britain are also traditionally very pro-NATO, and there's differences sometimes between foreign ministries and defense ministries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm very sorry about the, the frog in my throat, but maybe the simplest way I can explain it uh, if I was to tweet it, as it were, you know, Germany remains reluctant to use military force. Britain remains reluctant to act European only. And France is stuck in the middle between the two, because France is very happy to work with Germany on European issues. But when it comes to military issues, France is still has a much closer strategic culture to the UK. We are both UNSC, UN Security Council permanent members, of course, nuclear powers. Etc. They both feel a certain sense of responsibility for global security in a way that Germany is only starting to kind of discover recently. I was struck, for instance, that Germany now is sending ships to the Indo-Pacific. That was unheard of a few years ago, uh, whereas France and Britain have been doing that for a long time. <clears throat> and even on CSEP, France and Germany, because now obviously the UK has left, France and Germany would have quite different visions. You know, many German politicians over the years have said um, that they would like the EU to have an army. Whereas France, I think, would much prefer to have a European military alliance. I can't imagine France ever giving up the power of its own defense forces to a European super state, for example. But it would be very happy to lead a European military alliance, um, since it would be the major power as well. Um, And this brings me to the final lesson, which I learned while I was working at the European Movement in Dublin, European Movement Ireland, because there I was focusing much more on Brexit <coughs> in general. Uh, and the basic lesson I learned there, and this is the, the sixth lesson and the final lesson, is that Brexit, in my opinion, not only has, but will greatly reduce the relevance of EU defense of CSDP and EU military cooperation, as I say, is a more accurate way to describe what the EU actually does. Um, but unfortunately, I think it will reduce the relevance of EU military cooperation for a couple of reasons. Now, some, some people in the CSDP epistemic community, uh, the people who follow this closely, would find that very counterintuitive because they would point out that Britain blocked a lot of initiatives political, politically, wasn't always the most active contributor. However, I think that's a little unfair to the British contribution. I mean, after all, CSDP wouldn't have been born without British agreement to begin with. But secondly, Britain did uh, contribute heavily to some of the more difficult operations, such as in Bosnia or larger uh, operations, such as in Bosnia, and indeed at the moment there's difficulty finding uh, peacekeepers to replace the British who've left, and also one of the more successful EU operations, the counter-piracy operation uh, of Somalia in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, you know, so it wouldn't be fair to say that Britain made very little contribution and just blocked everything. Uh, it just didn't want the EU to duplicate NATO, 
which frankly I think suited Ireland just fine for completely different reasons, but it doesn't matter. Uh, I think a second reason though is the relationship with France. I mentioned already how France and Britain have a very close strategic culture, particularly on the use of military force. And it's no coincidence that since Brexit and since Macron's election, he made a speech in 2017, and this is still his basic vision, the Sorbonne speech it's called, his basic vision for the future of the EU. And it's, it's quite interesting, it's quite compelling vision in many ways. And he talks about Britain finding its way back into a, a, in a ways of cooperation with everybody once we get this Brexit thing sorted out. <coughs> <coughs> but in that speech, he also mentions another idea uh, called the European Intervention Initiative. Now, which is sort of really what CCP originally was supposed to be. So why would France be proposing something separate from CSDP? Well, two reasons. One, the European Intervention Initiative only has 14 countries so far, last time I checked, and they include the UK. Um, you know, so that's very important for France. That also includes Norway uh, as well, and, other, and Denmark, which is also not involved in CSDP. Norway, of course, not an EU member. So it's very much focused on an ad hoc group in a way of whatever works. Those who are most interested in carrying out robust interventions, particularly to the South. And as you know, France has also been very active in the Sahel since 2013, in Mali in particular. And of course, Irish uh, soldiers have been there too. Uh, I think it's part of the EU operation, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and indeed, the United States has been very helpful to France uh, in the Sahel, as helpful as many of the bigger Europeans. It has certainly around the EU table. Uh, it's striking that France made no headway in getting much help uh, really uh, uh, from the CSDP table, if I can put it that way, beyond the training operation. And there is a UN operation as well. Um, but interestingly, when PESCO, there is a link here between Macron's intervention initiative and PESCO. So we'll end up going from San Malo to PESCO in a nutshell. When PESCO was originally conceived, uh, this would have been 20 years ago, you had a body called the European Convention, not that we need more institutions, but this body basically produced what became the Lisbon Treaty. And PESCO was originally conceived exactly along the lines of what Macron has proposed of the European Intervention Initiative, to be operationally ambitious. Those who wanted to be more robust, to intervene more robustly would cooperate together and France and Britain would set the gold standard for that group. It would be exclusive. So again, my recollection at the time that the idea was roughly 10 out of the 28 countries or uh, of course there were fewer then, but you get my basic point, but it was supposed to be uh, um, exclusive and focused on operations. Since Brexit, Germany has pushed very hard for PESCO to become inclusive, and now there are 25 countries at least in it, last time I checked, and focused on capabilities, which is a very different focus to operations. So if you remember the two things the EU does, operations and capabilities in a nutshell, PESCO was originally supposed to be about operations and now it's about capabilities. And that to me suggests that I wouldn't be expecting the EU to do much peacekeeping wise in the future. That to me suggests France has essentially given up on the EU operationally. And that is not necessarily a good thing from an Irish point of view. I would prefer the EU to be more active in helping the UN when it needs help, particularly for rapid reaction. Um, you know, although obviously there are still uh, UN operations in any case, uh, but I think having the EU option would be a very good thing for the United Nations. Um, so in that respect, I'm not convinced the EU is going to, to contribute a lot more to international security if it's not doing much more on international peacekeeping. And in, even if you look at the new operations that have been initiated in the last decade, most of them uh, the biggest ones have been naval operations, which are really more homeland security in the Mediterranean, you know, and helping out and humanitarian homeland security, if you, if you prefer, um, saving the lives of, of refugees 
and migrants trying to cross the Mediterranean. But there's very little appetite, even for example, a few years ago, there were discussions, the Italians and the French, well, they argue a lot over Libya, but there was the idea about having an EU peacekeeping force at some stage. It just doesn't seem it'll happen. And France, I think, has decided, well, with the British out, we want to keep working with the British. So let's pursue this intervention initiative outside EU structures. So I'm not very hopeful, frankly, at the moment uh, for the future of CSDP, of EU military cooperation. It was born at Saint Malo in 1998 with a lot of ambition and a very reasonable strategic rationale, I would say. Having a plan B, whatever the form, in the, in the basic sense, I think made a lot of sense because it was born out of Franco-British alignment and it has not matched those ambitions. So there's a whole host of reasons why that is. And I just don't think it will uh, as long as basically, to paraphrase George Orwell, as long as CSDP is down in Paris and out in London. Thank you very much. Uh, that was super. Thank you. That was uh, excellent. Uh, very good indeed. So we do have a, a number of questions here already. So um, let me uh, put the first one here from Catherine Barrett. Do you have any thoughts on the significance of the EU agency Frontex as a uniformed armed border force? There seems to be some incremental move towards a unified force of some sorts, somewhere in between uh, internal and external security. Want to take a few, Maya Lisa? Um, well, we only have three there at the moment, so. Uh, <laughs> okay. No, 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 sure, no problem. Sorry, David Barry has the same. Yeah, yeah, very similar. Um, so David Barry's uh, comment um, is the EU now has its own uniform force since Frontex has transformed into the EU border and Coast Guard agency with new authority to buy and operate its own aircraft, ships, etc., rather than use national assets. Is there a potential for mission creep into law enforcement or defence areas beyond border control, e.g. fisheries, arms interdiction, piracy, etc.? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And it links actually kind of neatly with the point I was making at the end about the growth of homeland security um, as a topic. And, <laughs> and it's a very interesting field, but I'm more an expert on CSTP. I mean, Frontex and all of that is more to do with internal security and what used to be called at least justice and home affairs. So it's quite a different animal in that respect. And the two don't overlap as much as you'd expect in the EU system. You know, so for instance, Borrell, the EU high representative, chairs uh, the foreign ministers and his representative, where he chairs the defence ministers, development ministers. There's no equivalent of Borrell on the internal security side. There is a counterterrorism czar, but they don't chair the interior ministers, if you see what I'm getting at. Mm. So it's quite a different system and so there's quite different dynamics. Uh, so I'm not a great expert on Frontex, uh, but it is striking that they are now trying to build up a capacity of some sort. But my understanding is that the idea is like, for example, at the moment, they're mainly helping Greece. If, uh, yeah. And my understanding is it's very much under the control of the Greek authorities when they're in the Greek space. Mm -hmm. And and it's really about giving the Greeks more capacity to cope, is my understanding. Is there a potential for mission creep? Well, I suppose there's always a potential for mission creep. Uh, but as far as going towards interdiction and things like that, that's way beyond the scope, I think, of what Frontex is doing now. And as far as I understand, it's really focused on the refugee crisis but frankly i'm not expert enough to give a to give a great answer on that okay i suppose it is homeland security again really isn't it yeah yeah and policing um and that brings in europol potentially euro just it's a whole nother world <laughs> sure, sure, sure. um okay so another question here um do you think the EU, eu trusts the us commitment to nato and european defense long term given that it's possible Trump could be re-elected in the next US election and reintroduce his policies re-NATO. And given this possibility, should the EU and NATO develop a joined up multinational defense plan to counter Russia and China? Oh, nice and easy. Uh, how long have you got? <laughs> no, ser seriously. Well, look, there are always kind of 
there's always a bit this tension, always has been at NATO and in, in European circles over how much can Europeans trust the Americans? And indeed for Americans, how much can we trust the Europeans to do their part as well? It was a little bit clearer in the Cold War because it was clear who the enemy was and it was clear where everybody had their niche capability, frankly. Okay. Uh, since that, it's a lot more complicated. <clears throat> I think in an odd way, I think the case for Europeans having a plan B, as I put it, it has become ever stronger. But I think Joe Biden won't help those making that case. Partly because I think Joe Biden would be much more likely to get involved in crises in and around Europe than Trump would have been, for example. Uh, unless the US is so busy with China that it's not able. Uh, but it's a question of willingness. The US takes, uh, the Biden people take European security seriously. Um, and they certainly take the, the, the problem of Russia uh, fairly seriously, uh, not least given what happened in 2016 with the US election. Um, so there's a very strong suspicion of the Putin regime. So I think, frankly, you know, there was an awful lot of relief after Joe Biden was elected. And some of that relief could be heard very much in the German defense ministry, in the Italian defense ministry, <laughs> in the British defense ministry, and even the odd person in the French defense ministry. So, and certainly the Polish defense ministry, it depends. The, the, the Poles have a funny relationship with the Democrats uh, when it comes to Russia, but uh, so it's, it's very hard to tell. And I think it's exactly right to ask the question, okay, that's grand, we survive another four years. And then steel workers in Pittsburgh elect Trump again, and wh what do we do? And that's why I, I personally think we must have a, a plan B. I mean, that's the big lesson of the Trump era uh, for me. But I think the, the strategic case was there long before that. Um, when it comes to Russia and China, <clears throat> I personally think there is something to be said for a sort of, you know, the whole burden sharing debate in NATO and do the Europeans pull their weight and whether it's budgetary or military capability. I think there's a case for a geographic uh, split of burden sharing, where the US should focus a bit more on East Asia, because the Europeans can't bring that much to the table beyond France, Germany and Britain, a few ships. Um, and the Europeans have enough to keep themselves busy with in and around Europe anyway. If they did that well, that would actually be quite useful. Um, so I personally prefer, but some strategists would say that's too simplistic. And of course, for geopolitical reasons, especially for instance, global Britain, they will want to go where the US goes. And of course, France then will want to go and Germany will want to go. But I think there's a strong case for a geographic uh, burden sharing effort there. Very good. Okay, so uh, Jara Hearn um, writes, I was DFC of UN, Min Urkash, is it? M um, M yeah, yeah uh, Chad, which took over from the U4 Chad in March 2009. The challenges of EU supplying forces to UN missions is the utter incompatibility of UN civilian led missions, where the UN military forces subordinate to, to, subordinate to civilian leadership and EU military missions. Secondly, the logistical model of the UN is civilian led and overseen in direct contrast to a military logistical train. Severe negative lessons were seen in Chad of UN. Dash EU incompatibility in deployed missions. Um, I don't know. Do you want to comment? I, I suppose it's yeah. It, it's how the UN and the EU can work together. Yeah, uh, I mean, I see. I think obviously Jar is right. You know, um, that's one of the reasons Europeans are not always keen to deploy via the UN, unfortunately, because it has a very different culture in that respect, whether or not the EU should be maybe trying to have more influence on the UN peacekeeping culture, maybe that's an interesting question, especially for Ireland on the UN Security Council. I mean, now is the time to try and push these kinds of things in, in a better direction. Um, so the, I've heard similar complaints on other aspects to what Jarrah is saying, basically, about UN processes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, 
Nick Mala, is there any frustration evident in Europe with the very low level of defence spending in Ireland and our neutral status? Uh, beyond expert circles on defence, not really. I don't think most people notice, uh, to be honest. Um, it, it, within defence circles, it is noticeable. Uh, particularly, don't be surprised if someday you know, some smart aleck politician might say something like, well, we supported you on Brexit. Why don't you do more for our defence? And they have a point. Uh, you know, if the Balts or the Swedes or the Finns or someone came on came under a hybrid situation with Russia, the thing is, I think Ireland would support them immediately, as we did France, for instance, after the terrorist attacks in 2015, as we did when the French asked us to go to Chad. So while we have low defence spending and while we're non-aligned at the same time in the eu context ireland has usually not been the country that's been found wanting so we're, we kind of we, we 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 undersell the good things we do in my opinion ironically i i would focus more i would sell a lot more what we actually do um rather than always get caught up in a in, in a budgetary comparison because again we regularly deploy top three as a percentage of armed forces uh, deployed internationally. So in many ways, I think we have a great story to tell. But yes, um, there are, especially in NATO circles, they obviously think you may as well be Iceland and have no armed forces. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Dermot Igo uh, asks, UK did it CSDP but it uh, also worked hard to limit EU military cooperation. Surely Brexit would be good for, or will be good for CSDP. I suppose this is a point you've addressed in your, one of the lessons, wasn't it? Some people would agree with Dermot. You know, politically, it should make it easier. It will, it has made some, it has made PESCO easier, but I would argue PESCO now is going completely the wrong direction. <laughs> so, it makes the process easier in one way, but it might make the product worse, if that makes sense. Uh, so it depends a lot what you want CSDP to do, what you want it to achieve. Okay. Uh, Rob Gilby, is it too late for Ireland to take on a leading role in PESCO projects? How should Ireland seek a return on investment from its contribution to the EU Defence Fund, given our political sensitivities around proactive collective defence policies? Mm, it's a good question. I mean, I'm not sure about a leading role because it depends a lot. I would be very clear. I wouldn't join in a PESCO project just for the sake of it. It obviously has to be bringing something useful to the defence forces. That goes without saying. Uh, my understanding is that actually Irish industry does quite well <laughs> for the money that the Irish government puts in into these pots that uh, Irish industry, the civil military industry, if I can put it that way, which is our dual use industry actually does fairly well. Um, but I'm not well enough up to speed on the capability projects really to judge that okay. uh, at the moment. I haven't looked at PESCO projects in a while. Yeah, I, I think um, some of the people on this call would, uh, wouldn't agree that we're getting our money back or any anything like it. Um, an anonymous attendee uh, asks, if CSDP is effectively a military dead duck, is Ireland now limited to concentrating effort towards UN missions? Well, I think that is certainly the trend in the last few years. That can change. Uh, as I say, that's how it looks now. Um, but these things go up and down. In the, in the 2000s, you know, CSDP was extremely active and Ireland played its part. And uh, now it's less active, at least on things that matter for Ireland, in my opinion. Um, the other interesting angle, though, maybe just while it's in my head, is the increasing role of the EU in defence is sort of interesting, uh, which I would separate a little bit from CSDP. What I mean by that is, and it's something the Finns and the Swedes are very interesting, interested in because of the Russian threat. Namely, things like cyber defense, cyber security, and also things like military logistics, the whole military Schengen idea. Uh, that's more traditional defense as a kind of a supporting role. Uh, and it has a civilian, it's, as, it's a kind of a dual use situation. Uh, 
Um, but that's an angle on the debate I would keep an eye on. Um, again, does it really directly affect Ireland? Mm, it, it doesn't necessarily impact on our security in the same way, but it's something I would keep an eye on for the politics around the table in Brussels. Uh, and uh, one from Dorka Lee. Uh, great overview, uh, Dan. Thanks. Saves a lot of reading. The message <laughs> from, France, from France, Germany, Italy is that the EU should continue moving towards ever closer union. So this is a political uh, union. While CSDP may stall, common defence is still on the horizon. Without defence, uh, common defence, the union will not be complete. Common defence implies a level playing field and burden sharing on defence. Please comment. Well, he's right. I just don't think ever closer union is as nearly on the horizon as quickly as people might expect. Uh, and it won't be coming through the defence world. It'll be the, the Eurozone will, de in my humble opinion, will determine the future of the EU now, post-Brexit. How that evolves and how that emerges from COVID will be what really matters for the future of the EU. Um, and then within that context, where defence comes in will be interesting. But at the moment, Biden gives everybody the excuse not to take on the hard questions on defence. Uh, and, uh, and that simultaneously, while you have the really tough questions on fiscal policy, budgets, uh, and the evolution and the economic recovery. Okay. Um, so another, um, one more question here. Will the loss of UK capability and expertise deliver a blow to European security. So I think that's something you've touched on. Yeah, yeah, it's a blow to the EU's ability. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. The good news is, though, I mean, the UK obviously is still at the table at NATO, at the UN, and bilateral things. So it's not, as Theresa May used to say, we're leaving the EU, but we're not leaving Europe. And maybe even surprisingly, Cooperation with the EU on some military projects, whether it's a PESCO project or something, might actually be helpful politically now, given there are so many other tensions over the protocol, over trade more broadly, they'll need something to, to say something positive. So ironically, defence might offer that opportunity. So it's not all bad news. Uh, and a question from Norman Scott. Um, does Mark Mellet's role in the Azure Forum have any influence or impact on what's being discussed? And I suppose that has to be a future question, really, because he's only recently become chairman of the Azure Forum. Uh, well, I'm not very familiar with the Azure Forum yet myself, so I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> okay. uh, a bit of a think, a think tank also in Dublin. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I know, um, um, Daniel, I think they're all the questions that have been asked so far, but also, um, that you are taking a great interest as well in uh, internal um, affairs in Ireland and what's happening, the dynamics in, in the north, and particularly around you know, follow post Brexit, but um, also you know the, the debate within unionism now and the debate around uh, the border poll, etc. Maybe you want to have a say a few words on that before before we finish off. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean the way things. How can I put this? You know, uh, we're, we, are, we are all well aware how annoyed and upset political unionism is about the protocol. And they're not entirely, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's perfectly fine to have some sympathy there. You know, they, I know not, there's not a, a practical equivalence between the sea border and the land border, but in, in terms of identity, they see it very similarly to how many in Ireland, in the Republic, see the land border. And I don't think that's always fully appreciated uh, beyond the unionist community, even in the UK, by, uh, in Great Britain, by the way. Um, what's kind of bothering me lately, uh, my, now this is just my gut instinct at the moment. I'm not convinced the British government wants to scrap the protocol as many in, as all the Northern Ireland unionist parties want. Uh, however, they do want to make sure the EU is blamed for everything. And what's bugging me a little bit is, you know, there are a lot of practical problems and even Northern Ireland business, many of whom are neutral, frankly, on these constitutional questions, are really annoyed with the EU. And to them, it looks like it's the British government that's trying to help them, not the EU or Ireland, by the way. 
And I feel while I understand where the EU is coming from, and there's very good reasons the EU is annoyed because the British government is not doing what it promised to do and things would work smoother if they did. And the British government is saying the EU is not moving quickly to help you. And the EU is a terrible communicator. It's not very good at politics, at local politics. Um, and I think this is where the Irish government and the EU should think hard and realize we have a joint responsibility. Forget about Brexit and who's to blame for that. Now we're in post-Brexit land and we're in protocol land and both the EU and the UK have a joint responsibility and the reflex of just blaming everything on the British government. Uh, I think we'd be wise to take a step back and see and turn that and see this as an opportunity to explain to unionists and ideally publicly um, what this is really about. And at least, OK, you're not going to convince all of them to agree with you, but at least the people in the middle will know exactly what you're about and why you're doing it. Because the, the danger is that while, yes, we, we have the Friends of Ireland caucus in Washington, at the end of the day, we have to be wanting to help everybody in Northern Ireland. And we're losing that narrative at the moment. Uh, and that's why when we say we're supporting the GFA, it makes it easy then for the unionists to be hypercritical. Um, and the British government is, has been clever enough in that respect in the communications game. So there we are. So well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. It's been an excellent evening. And um, on behalf of all, uh, everybody who, who managed to log in tonight, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but, uh, thank you sincerely. Uh, really appreciate it and uh, look forward to um, having contact with you uh, going forward. And um, oh, Absolutely. Yeah. No, th thank you very much, Melissa, and to everyone who I could, I, I certainly recognise some of the names of the questioners. And thank you all very much for logging in. Okay. Have a good okay. evening. Bye now. Bye now. And bye, bye to all our attendees.